Tonight we celebrate the story and the songs of Fanny Crosby, author of some 9,000 hymns in her lifetime. Her life and faith in the face of adversity is an encouragement to all. Now we're going to be telling her story and interspersing her songs, uh, most of which we will sing. We have a few of them that are not in our hymnal, but uh, we're going to share videos of these songs. Now the story, or actually excerpts from a book, it's called Fanny Crosby, the Hymn Writer. And this book will be in our church library. If you are inspired by her story tonight and would like to read more, uh, this will be available in our library. Fanny Crosby in her day was considered the greatest hymn writer in America. In his 1924 autobiography, George C. Stebbins, another prominent hymn writer, an evangelical singer wrote, there is probably no writer in her day who appealed more to the valid experience of the Christian life or who expressed more sympathetically the deep longings of the human heart than Fanny Crosby. In 1904, the well-known singing evangelist Ira Sankey, partner and colleague of D.L. Moody, said the success of their evangelical campaigns resulted largely from Fanny Crosby's hymns. This is a story of a woman from humble origins, blind almost from birth, who achieved fame as a poet, educator, and musician before becoming known throughout the English-speaking world as the foremost hymn writer of her generation. Probably her best-known hymn and one that is loved throughout the world is number 289 in your hymnal, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. We're going to sing the first verse. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. On March 24th, 1820, John and Mercy Crosby gave birth to a daughter, christened Frances Jane Crosby, after one of her mother's numerous aunts, Fanny Paddock Curtis. By late April, her parents were alarmed. Something was wrong with the baby's eyes. In later years, Fanny spoke of a sickness that made her eyes very weak. More disconcerting, the family was unable to obtain competent medical assistance because the community doctor was away. Finally, they found a man who claimed to be a physician. Fanny later wrote of him as a stranger. Whoever he was, he horrified the Crosbys by putting a hot poultice on the baby's inflamed eyes. The doctor insisted the extreme heat would not hurt the child's eyes, but would draw out the infection. When he had finished these treatments, the infection did gradually clear up, but there was scar tissue on her eyes. And as the months went by, little Fanny Jane made no response when objects were held in front of her face. Further disaster was to strike the household. November of 1820 was cold and rainy, but her father, John Crosby, labored in the fields, even in downpours. One night he came in badly chilled. 
The next day he was seriously ill, and a few days later he died, before Fanny was even a year old. Shortly after, her husband's body was lowered into an unmarked grave. Mercy, which is Fanny's mother, hired herself out as a maidservant to a wealthy family nearby. Fanny Jane would be taken good care of by Mercy's mother, Eunice. Grandma Eunice took a special interest in Fanny, and during the child's first four or five years was closer than even her own mother. My grandmother was more to me than I can ever express by word or pen, Fanny would later write. When it became obvious that Fanny was deprived of eyesight, Eunice decided that she would be her granddaughter's eyes. She firmly resolved that her granddaughter would not be a helpless invalid dependent on others as so many blind people were in those days. She undertook to describe the physical world to the child in terms she hoped she could understand. Eighty years later, Fanny recalled her grandmother taking me on her knee and rocking me while she told me of the beautiful sun with its sunrise and sunset. Eunice also had a great influence on Fanny's religious development. All of the Crosbys were Christians, but Eunice seemed to have been particularly devout. From as early as Fanny could remember, Eunice would assemble the children and read the Bible to them. The stories of the holy book came from her lips and entered my heart, Fanny would write later, and it took deep root there. Eunice did not simply read from the Bible without comment, but she took time and explained so that they could understand what she was saying. Now, another song that I'd like us to sing is number 237. And when you consider Fanny's situation, especially as a child, this takes on new meaning. Tell me the story of Jesus. That was the only way she would know it. And this was what her grandmother did. So number 237, tell me the story of Jesus. And we're going to sing the first verse. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings to earth. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. From the time it was apparent that Fanny was blind, Mercy did not give up hope for a cure. And for the first five years of her life, Mercy collected generous contributions from neighbors from miles around, scraped up enough money to go to New York City to procure an appointment for Fanny to be examined by Dr. Valentine Mott, one of America's finest surgeons at Columbia University School of Medicine. But in New York, the cheerfulness waned. Mercy and Fanny were taken into Dr. Mott's offices where an eye specialist had been called in. They confirmed the suspicion of Mercy and her parents that the so-called doctor who had treated Fanny Jane's eyes had utterly ruined them. The poultice had burned her corneas, causing scar tissue to form. This made for a kind of vision or a lack of vision, which might be compared to looking through a glazed or an iced window. The child could experience some light, 
and a little bit of color, but little else. There was absolutely nothing they could do. The damage was irreversible. Fanny was not totally blind. Even in her 80s, she could distinguish day from night. At that point in her life, a friend remarked that she wished Fanny could see the sunlight on a particularly beautiful day. And Fanny responded, I know it. I feel it. And I see it too. Grandma had made it a point to visit Fanny several times a week. While Mercy was busy in the domestic chores of the household where she lived and worked, Eunice continued to educate her grandchild, giving her portions of the Bible to memorize when she was about eight. And it was about this time when Fanny wrote her first poem. And I think it says so much about this little girl and her outlook on life. Oh, what a happy child I am, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. So weep or sigh because I'm blind, I cannot, nor I won't. She was not going to allow her blindness to keep her from being what God would have her to be. And when she was about eight or nine, she began memorizing the entire Bible. Verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And at one time, she was learning up to five chapters a week. In no time at all, she had memorized the first five books of the Bible. Genesis Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. She could recite them by heart. At the end of two years, she could not only repeat from memory those first five books, but also all four Gospels, many of the Psalms, all of the Proverbs, all of the Book of Ruth, and what she called the greatest of all poems, the Song of Solomon by nine or ten years old, had them memorized. This training served Fanny for a lifetime. From then on, she needed no one to read the Bible to her. Whenever she needed to read a passage, she turned a little button on in her mind, and the appropriate passage would flow through her brain like a tape recording. In her 11th and 12th years, Fanny felt increasingly shut out of the world. She was beginning to realize a great store of knowledge lay waiting out there, but since she was blind and had no chance for an education, there seemed no way for her to tap it. She attended the district schools occasionally, but the local schoolmaster didn't know how to instruct the blind, and she would quit in complete frustration after a few days. At 14, Fanny, small in stature, was a lively little girl with jet black curls, Although not especially attractive, she had a personality of rare intensity and vitality that tended to express itself in passionate emotions, violent sorrow as well as violent joy. Whatever she did, horseback riding, playing the guitar, singing, telling stories, writing poetry, she did with a fierce passion that was almost more than her meager frame could bear, and it was to be so throughout her life. She still attended the district school in spurts, but the harried schoolmaster with more students than he could handle had no time for the special attention and training she needed. Again, after attending class a few days, Fanny in despair would drop out. But in November of 1834, Mercy read to her a circular about a newly founded New York Institute for the Blind. Fanny clapped her hands and cried, Oh, thank God, he has answered my prayer just as I knew he would. Seventy years of joy and sorrow later, she could still describe that day as one of the happiest days of her life. With her keen mind, Fanny quickly mastered her lessons in English, grammar, science, music, history, philosophy, astronomy, and political economy. 
The lessons were given in the forms of lectures and readings after which the pupils were expected to answer detailed questions on the text they had heard. The next day they were to paraphrase the entire lesson. She was in love with grammar, philosophy, astronomy, and political science, but she had trouble with math and Braille. She never could master reading Braille. She blamed this on playing the guitar because the guitar strings had calloused her fingertips, and she couldn't, she, her fingertips weren't sensitive enough to uh, distinguish the raised Braille print. After she left the institution, she rarely used Braille. She relied more on her memory and her training. Whenever she wanted to read a book, she'd have somebody read it to her, and after hearing it one time, she had it in her memory. In the coming weeks and months, the quality of her poetry rapidly improved. Before she was 20, she was one of the Institute's most promising pupil. She had become proficient at the piano and the organ, and was reputed to be one of the finest harpists around. Another song of hers that uh, uh, is a, a favorite, I know when I was growing up, we used to sing it a lot in my home church, is number 265. Number 265, Draw Me Nearer. Draw Me Nearer. Let's sing the first verse. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith, and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. In late 1850, Fanny had what we might call a conversion experience, even though she had a thorough knowledge of the Bible before that. It wasn't until 1850 that she really gave her heart fully to the Lord. About that time, Fanny came to work with a man named George Frederick Root. He had given some music lessons at the Institute in the 1840s, but it wasn't until the next decade that Fanny came to know him as a person. One day in 1851, Root was playing the piano and Fanny was listening. The poet was deeply moved by the strains of this original composition, which sounded like the music of some European master. Oh, why don't you publish that, Mr. Root, she asked. Root, a small bearded man, looked at her with piercing bird-like eyes and said, Why, I have no words for it. Oh, I can think of words, Fanny said. Your melody says, Oh, come to the greenwood where nature is smiling. Come to the greenwood so lovely and gay. There will be soft music, thy spirit beguiling. Tenderly carol thy sadness away. On the spot, listening to the song, she had words. And she would often say that certain music would speak to her. And she could just hear the, the message that that particular music was playing. Root was enthusiastic. I can use you, he said. I need someone to supply words to the songs that I write. Would you be willing to do that? Fanny wrote several songs that first summer. Root supplied all the music. Fanny supplied all the words. At least two pieces became fairly popular. Fare Thee Well, Kitty Dear, and The Hazel Dell. Trite, sentimental songs of the type that appealed so much to listeners of that era. Root was very pleased, recognizing Fanny as a lady who had a great gift for rhyming 
and better still, a del delicate and poetic imagination. During the summer of 1855, Fanny once again collaborated with Root in writing songs. Several became hits. Three songs they wrote that year became especially popular. Now, nobody knew that Fanny Crosby was the lyricist to these songs because they appeared only under Root's byline. The royalty on one song amounted to $3,000. Remember, this is in 1850. But Fanny only received a dollar or two. Root bought the poems from Fanny, published them himself, and reaped the benefits of the popularity alone. He considered he had no further obligation to Fanny after paying the standard fee publishing companies normally paid their poets. But at no time did Fanny feel that she had been taken advantage of or uh, that she was uh, being treated unfairly. In fact, whenever she made money, she gave most of it away. Once her own personal needs were met, she tried to support other ministries and missions and gave most of the money away that she made in writing her songs. Now, several of the songs that she wrote give her testimony of her salvation, and one in particular is number 140, and you see this idea of redemption an awful lot in her songs. This was something that was very popular in the preaching of that day. Many of the preachers spoke of being redeemed, being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So let's sing number 140, Redeemed, How I Love to Proclaim It. We'll sing the first verse. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. At the age of 35, Fanny had a heart that was hungry for love, but she was still a spinster. However, in 1855, the institution acquired a new teacher, Alexander Van Alstein, whom Fanny had met as a boy years earlier in the tour, during a tour at Oswego, New York. Van, as he was known, studied for a few years at the institute and became a brilliant pupil. In 1848, he became the first pupil from the Institute for the Blind to enroll at a regular college. His chosen vocation was music, but he also mastered Greek, Latin, philosophy, and theology. And if you haven't picked it up by now, he too was blind. By the early 1850s, he had a teaching certificate and was giving music lessons in the Albion, New York area in their public schools. In 1855, he returned to the Institute as a music instructor. Now at first, Fanny and Van had a merely platonic relationship based on their mutual love of music and poetry. Van became deeply interested in Fanny's poetry and she became interested in his music. In her words, thus we soon grew to be very much concerned for each other. Now, in the fall of 1857, Van left the Institute and began giving private music lessons in Long Island, what is now the borough of Queens. Fanny was prepared to follow him. She terminated her long relationship with the Institute on March 2, 1858, and headed toward Long Island, marriage, and an independent life. They were married in a private ceremony on March 5th in the little town of Maspeth, Fanny, or Van was 27, Fanny was 38. Her existence changed altogether. 
She was no longer the center of attention as she had been at the Institute, visited by dignitaries. She no longer lived near the nation's greatest cultural center, famed as the blind poetess. She was now a housewife, married to a struggling music teacher, living in rented rooms in a country town where few of the farmers, merchants, and laborers realized their blind, dwarf-like neighbor was a nationally known poet. Yet this life pleased her, for she never liked publicity or the attendant crowds. For the first time in two decades, she was back where she loved to be, in the country, and she felt that she was living to benefit not so much the general public, but her husband. In the spring of 1858, Fanny seemed to be on the threshold of a dream come true. Now about her married life, we know almost nothing. Precious little is known of her husband. In one autobiography, Fanny says that his father, an engineer, was from the banks of the Rhine and emigrated to the States as a young man. His mother was born in England. Van is said to have lost his sight in early childhood as a result of sickness. The two pictures we have of him indicate a rather handsome man, slender, with finely chiseled Teutonic face and clean shaven, which was very rare among the men of that generation. Van was one of New York's finest organ virtuosos. He was also proficient at piano, cornet, and other instruments. To support Fanny and himself, he served as a paid organist to various area churches. About 1859, Fanny became a mother, but the child died in infancy. This was perhaps the greatest misfortune in Fanny's life. She almost never spoke of it. We don't even know if the baby was a boy or a girl, or what was the cause of death. After this tragedy, Fanny's dream of a quiet, secluded life in rural Long Island seemed to have exploded. She gradually recovered, but longed to return to her familiar surroundings. So she and Van returned to Manhattan about 1860 and took a room a few blocks away from the Institute. Later, Fanny teamed up with Howard Doan, a Christian business tycoon. He apparently came by his wealth honestly and was never accused of greed, injustice, or corruption. He gave a large percent of his income to charitable institutions in a time before tax laws made it expedient for the rich to do so. He was an active lay worker in the Mount Auburn Baptist Church in a Cincinnati suburb where he had a mansion. This began a collaboration that would last 47 years. Howard and Fanny became close personal friends. Fanny often spent her summers with him and his wife, who was also named Fanny, and their daughters, Ida and Marguerite. Doan set more than a thousand of Fanny's hymns to music, even though he was not a great musician. He was best at writing simple, straightforward, almost march-like tunes. But Fanny liked to collaborate with him she believed that simple, catchy tunes were best understood and remembered by most people. One must remember that in those days there was little opportunity for people to hear a repeated melody, for there were no recordings, and most people were too poor to own a piano or even a hymnal. So when one first heard the tune of a hymn, it was often a matter of memorizing it then, or not at all. Once Doan appeared at Fanny's flat, I have exactly 40 minutes, he said, before I must catch a train to Cincinnati. I have a tune for you. See if it says anything to you. Perhaps you can commit it to memory and then compose a poem to match it. He hummed a simple melody. After hearing it one time, Fanny clapped her hands as she did whenever something pleased her. Why, that says, safe in the arms of Jesus. She wrote her best hymns when the tunes spoke to her. Scurrying to the other room of the apartment, she knelt on the floor and, as was her custom before composing a hymn, asked God for inspiration. Seeing that his servant was in a hurry, God saw fit to grant it quickly. Within a half an hour, Fanny had a complete poem. Returning to Doan before he got on the train, she quickly dictated, Safe in the arms of Jesus, safe on his gentle breast, there by his love were shaded, sweetly my soul shall rest. 
Hark, tis the voice of angels, born in a song to me, over the fields of glory, over the jasper sea. Safe in the arms of Jesus, safe on his gentle breast, there by his love were shaded, sweetly my soul shall rest. It became an instant success. It was sung all over the country. And Fanny always had a special attachment to this song. She claimed it had been written for all those who had lost loved ones. And one can't help but wonder if maybe this wasn't a song she wrote for her own child who was lost in infancy. It's a song that is often used at funerals. It's not one that is found in our hymnal, but I did find a recording of it that I'd like to share with you now. Safe in the arms of Jesus, safe on his gentle breast, there by his love or shame. Yeah. 
You'll notice in many of her songs, she refers to seeing. You saw it in this particular song, and she would often refer to the very ability she did not have. And she was never bitter about not having her sight. In fact, she said, one of the great blessings is that when I get to heaven, the very first face I shall see is the face of Jesus. Rather than allowing that to hinder her in her growth, she saw it as an opportunity for God to work in her life. Fanny was introduced to D.L. Moody and Ira Sankey while they were in New York in 1876. And from then on, these three were known together. Through their appearances, many of her hymns were introduced to mass audiences. Moody and Sankey were eager for Fanny to supply them with hymns, recognizing her as one of the greatest contemporary hymn writers. Ira Sankey, well, here's Moody and Sankey as they were portrayed back then. Sankey, in particular, began to fill subsequent editions of his hymnals with her efforts in collaborating uh, with previous uh, publishing houses he obtained the rights to many of the hymns she had already written. He engaged her to write new ones, and he began to write melodies to many of her poems. Though untrained, he often produced melodies of heart-rendering sweetness. Many of them that they used in their evangelistic campaigns were used to draw people to the Savior. And tonight, Tina is going to share one of those songs with us, it is found in your hymnal, it's hymn number 407, and it is the song, Near the Cross. <coughs> Tonight I'm going to do Near the Cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There's a precious fountain Free to all a healing stream Flows from Calvary's mountain In the cross, in the cross <clears throat> Be my glory Till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross a trembling soul, love and mercy found me. Sheds its beams around me in the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the scenes before me. Help me walk from day to day with the shadows over me. In the cross, in the cross, be <coughs> my glory Till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross 
a watch and wait, hoping, trusting ever, till I reach the golden strand just beyond the river. beyond the river. I think that's a wonderful uh, way to approach the Lord's table. And as we gather tonight uh, for communion, think about those words, near the cross. Keep me near the cross. Even with all of the fame that she would attain, Fanny Crosby always remained humble. One of the things that I haven't had an opportunity, I had to cut an awful lot of her story out of tonight. I would highly encourage you to, to read this book if you get the chance. She was known to many of the presidents of the United States throughout her life, and yet... She always remained humble. She always kept her feet on the ground. And I think it's because of what Tina just sang. In the cross was her glory. She never took her eyes off of the Lord. While the communion is being passed, uh, we're going to have another video of one of her songs uh, by a singer named Guy Penrod. Um, another favorite hymn. He hideth my soul. Will you bow with me in prayer? Father, we do approach the table tonight with humbled hearts. So often we allow the circumstances of life to keep us from serving you and doing what we ought to do. I pray that tonight as we are inspired by this testimony, that we would see how much you can do through the life of someone who is sold out to you. We thank you for our Savior who gave his all that we might be your children. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of my Lord, he taketh my burdens away. He holdeth me up, and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength. my 
the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land he hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me salvation is wonderful love I'll shout with the millions of In March of 1891, Fanny's cousin, Howard Crosby, who was a Presbyterian pastor, died of pneumonia at age 65. Not long afterward, Lucius Biglow read her a pamphlet containing the text of Dr. Crosby's last message. It said that no Christian should fear death. If each of us is faithful to the grace which is given us by Christ, that same grace which teaches us how to live will also teach us how to die. Moved by that last message, Fanny wrote a poem called Someday. It was written in a matter of minutes under divine inspiration as she had written her best hymns in the 60s and 70s. She put it in the hands of Biglow who paid her the usual two dollars and put it in his vault. For three years, Someday seemed destined to be one of those poems Fanny considered among her better efforts but was never set to music. But with slight variations, this poem, which she called her heart's song, was to become the well-known Saved by Grace. Fanny had good reason to reflect on death that year. First, her mother had died. Then, her cousin Howard. In July, she received word from Bridgeport that the white-robed angel had taken her favorite grandniece, Claire Morris, after a bout with scarlet fever. Fanny had not fully recovered from that blow when in September she learned that Joseph Knapp had died suddenly aboard ship while returning with Phoebe from a European vacation. In 1894, George C. Stebbins, was given the opportunity to set Fanny's heart song to music. He set it to a slow tune. Although the music is not particularly delicate or melodic, Fanny's heart song became a favorite among Christians the world over. D.L. Moody loved it as soon as he heard it, and it was to be Fanny's last truly popular hymn. It is not a hymn that is in our hymnal, and so I was able to find a video of her last great hymn, Saved by Grace.
August of 1914, Fanny suffered a mild heart attack. She again believed her time had come. During the illness, she had visions, and when she was better, she reported that they were some of the most remarkable of her life. She said very little about the nat their nature, except that in one, an angel came to her and said, Be thou faithful, and I will give thee the crown of life. Almost word for word, quotation from Revelation. The angel also said, Be calm, and get your strength back as soon as you can, and then go to, the work, go to work for the master once more. Fanny partially recovered, but the doctors told Florence her aunt would not live many more months. Fanny welcomed her approaching end with joy. She was going to just pass to that glorious land, she told her friends. When I have arrived at my eternal home, they will say, come in, Fanny, come in. Then will be the victory through Christ. But as the angel had bidden, while life lasted, she still had work for the master. First and foremost, Fanny felt that the angel wanted her to give the world a few more hymns before she departed. Indeed, Alan Sankey and Hugh Maine were planning their first major hymnal in a decade and asked Fanny to contribute. In the next few months, she wrote about a dozen hymns. Among the best was Keep Thou Me. In January, the aged Howard Doan, suffering from creeping paralysis and bedridden, able to only sit up for a few moments each day, decided to write one last song. He sent word to his old colleague that he would like her to write the lyrics. In early February, she wrote what was to prove her swan song of hymns. At evening time it shall be light, when fades the day of toil away. No shadows deep, no weary night, at evening time it shall be light. At evening time it shall be light, immortal love from realms above is breathing now the promise bright, at evening time it shall be light. Fanny began to make preparations for her death and burial. She made Florence and Jewel promise any memorial in her memory would not be pretentious. On February the 8th, Fanny was visited by a group of mission workers and she spoke of her life telling them she was especially concerned with four categories of people, railroad men, policemen, prisoners, and the poor. To the mission workers, Fanny reiterated what she had said all her life about her blindness. This loss of sight has been no loss to me. On the 10th, another blind musician came, and they played a duet on the piano. On the 11th, Fanny said she didn't feel well and would stay in bed. Her appetite that had always been so good was beginning to fail. Tomorrow I shall be well, she said, and seemed radiant with joy. At nine that night she sent for Eva Cleveland and asked her to take down a letter to a neighbor family who had just lost a child, assuring them that, quote, your precious Ruth is safe in the arms of Jesus. After completing the letter, she dictated her final testimony to the world. In the morn of Zion's glory, when the clouds have rolled away and my hope has dropped its anchor in the veil of perfect day, when all the pure and holy I shall strike my harp anew with a power no arm can sever, love will hold me fast and true. About 3.30, Florence heard her aunt walking down the hall. Getting up to a sister, she met Fanny at the doorway to her room. And there, to her horror, Fanny fainted in her arms. Florence carried the meager figure back to bed, awoke her husband and son, and called two doctors. The first of the doctors arrived about 4.30 and pronounced her dead of a massive cerebral hemorrhage. According to many witnesses, Fanny Crosby's was the largest funeral ever seen in Bridgeport, even surpassing that of the famed circus man P.T. Barnum. People stood for blocks to file by the beer. In her right hand was a little silk flag that she always carried. On the casket, at the request of Jewel, were engraved the words, My Sister. George Stebbins, Alan Sankey, who was Ira Sankey's son, and Hugh Maine were there. The church was full of the flowers Fanny had loved. The choir sang her favorite hymn, Faith of Our Fathers. 
The pastor prayed at great length. And then the choir sang, safe in the arms of Jesus and saved by grace, as many wept openly. Now, until 1955, there was nothing to mark Fanny's grave except a tiny marble stone with the words Aunt Fanny and the inscription, She hath done what she could. Even that was more than she had asked. But on May 1st of it, of 1955, a large marble slab was erected on her grave because the Bridgeport citizens decided the relatively inconspicuous marker with only a vague identification was unworthy. The new inscription includes a verse from her now famous hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. I have saved my personal favorite of Fanny Crosby's hymns for last. And I think it would be a fitting way to end this evening. In your hymnal, if you would turn to hymn number 127. And I'm going to ask you to stand as we sing the first verse. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin and open the life gate that all may go in praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice praise the lord praise the lord let the people rejoice oh come to the father through jesus the son and give him the glory great things he hath done what a great testimony what a great encouragement to us that whatever obstacles we may face in our lives through the power of Jesus, we can overcome. We can make our life count. And we can touch the lives of people we may never see, but that will be inspired to follow after Christ. May this be our theme as we leave. To God be the glory. Great things He hath done. Yes, tonight we have featured the life and the music of Fanny Crosby. She would probably be embarrassed by such a, a devotion of this time to her. But remember, as she would say, give God the glory. Great things He has done and great things He wants to do through each and every one of us if we will allow Him to. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the life and the music of Fanny Crosby. What an inspiration she is. We thank you for using the talents that you gave her in a way that long after she has gone to be with you in glory, we still benefit from her life, from her, for her gift of writing hymns. And I pray that we might go from this place inspired and encouraged and motivated to live for you with whatever we have for as long as we have. To you be the glory. Great things you have done. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.